At the entrance of Kishinman, a group of citizens gathered, angrily demanding that Kiwan Bao, accused of colluding with Fox spirits, be handed over. Tian, a senior disciple, urged them not to spread false accusations. The leader of the citizens claimed that Kiwan Bao released the Fox spirits, leading to the deaths of many citizens. They insisted that Kiwan Bao and the Fox spirits were in cahoots, threatening to destroy Kishinman if she wasn't handed over. Kilian and the eldest senior brother intervened, asking the citizens about their grievances. The citizens explained that they sought justice for their deceased loved ones. Kiwan reassured them that she had not colluded with the fox spirits. Some argued that if the fox spirit took hearts from Kiwan Bao, more people would die. They demanded her surrender for the safety of the community. Huo's Huya stepped forward, stating that the fox spirit would no longer take hearts once Kiwan Bao married him the next day. The citizens whispered among themselves. Kiwan Bao arrived and questioned her father about the truth of the claim that marrying Huo's Huya would protect her from the fox spirit taking hearts. Kilian affirmed the legend, stating that once married, the fox spirit couldn't complete its ritual, preventing heart taking. Kiwan Bao pondered, and Huo's Huya reassured her not to feel pressured. The citizens, feeling deceived, erupted in anger, accusing Kishinman of deceit. The situation escalated into a physical confrontation. Kiwan Bao, raising her voice, promised to marry Huo's Huya the next day, ensuring the fox spirit wouldn't take hearts. At a turn on a hillside, a disciple of Huashinman quickly tossed a bag of silver to a group of unruly citizens. The citizens, taking the silver, nodded in satisfaction, saying that if there were similar matters in the future, they should remember to call on them for assistance. Suddenly, Huo, the young master, drew his sword and swiftly swung it, killing the citizens with a single stroke. Chen Jiu sat quietly, sipping tea and reading a book, when Habili approached him, questioning why he wasn't resting properly, especially considering his serious injuries. Chen Jiu inquired if his aunt had recently visited the city of Baixuan. Habili replied that his aunt hadn't left Baiming since her return, yet strangely, there had been a recent surge in deaths in Baixuan city. Both the citizens and practitioners were blaming it on the Fox Clan, a false accusation that unfairly implicated their Fox Clan. Habili expressed frustration, stating that they shouldn't have saved Lord Huo and Kiwan Bao in the first place, they were ungrateful and heartless individuals. Particularly, he criticized Kiwan Bao for betraying the genuine affection shown by Lord Huo and hastily agreeing to marry Huo's Huya the next day. To him, she was the ultimate traitor among traitors. Chen Jiu set aside his book, his expression turning serious. Chen Jiu transformed into a little fox and approached Kiwan Bao's room. Peering inside, he saw her trying on the wedding dress, so he decided to watch from a distance. Kiwan Bao, seemingly detached, allowed others to assist her with the fitting. After they left, she turned around and spotted the little fox. With joy in her voice, she called out to Chen Jiu and ran towards him. However, the little fox immediately vanished without a trace. Su Hanya found himself unable to sleep, his thoughts consumed by the fact that his cousin Kiwan Bao would be marrying Huo's Huya the next day. Determined to have a conversation with Huo's Huya that night, he got out of bed and prepared to leave. However, Sakin Kyun came looking for him. When he asked her why she was there, she explained that she was concerned about Kiwan Bao, fearing that someone might shed tears tonight. Unsettled, she wanted to check on things. Su Hanyu informed her of his intention to talk to Huo's Huya and asked her to wait for his return. However, Sakin Kyun insisted on accompanying him, trailing after him as he left. Huo's Huya was admiring his wedding attire when Huashin approached him, asking if he was truly certain. Huo's Huya inquired about the meaning of his father's words. Huashin explained that he knew Kiwan Bao didn't like him, so why force it? After all, forcibly obtained fruit is never sweet. He admitted that he no longer cared whether Kiwan Bao's feelings were genuine. Just then, Su Hanyu and Sakin Kyun arrived at the door. As they were about to knock, they overheard Huashin mentioning Huashia's lingering resentment. Huashin expressed his hope that after marrying Kiwan Bao, Huo's Huya would no longer target Chen Jiu. After all, it was Chen Jiu who saved his life in Yueshan. 
The recent plot against Chen Jiu, in which they all participated, had left him restless. Hearing this, Suhanya was furious and attempted to rush into the room, but Sakinkin stopped him. As Sakinkin led Suhanya away, he slipped and nearly fell, letting out a cry. Huo's Hua quickly followed and intercepted them. Suhanya vehemently declared that he would never allow his cousin to marry such a scoundrel. In response, Huo's Hua used force to bind them and locked them in a storage room, posting guards outside. As the wedding preparations were underway, Su Shenshen searched for her sister. Just then, senior brother Tian happened to pass by. She asked him if he had seen Su Hanyu and Su Qin Qin. Brother Tian explained that Su Young Master disapproved of his cousin's marriage, so he got drunk last night. He speculated that Su Hanyu might still be asleep. Brother Tian also mentioned that Su Qin Qin was with him. Upon hearing this, Su Shenshen breathed a sigh of relief one. The wedding commenced as Ki Wanbao and Huo's Hua, holding a crimson silk, walked in slowly. They performed the customary rituals, bowing to the heavens, then to their parents, and finally facing each other as husband and wife. Just then, Chen Jiu burst in, causing everyone present to stare in shock. Huo's Hua demanded to know why he dared to appear and swiftly drew his sword, aiming it at Chen Jiu. He assured Ki Wanbao that he was there to protect her. Chen Jiu, too, unsheathed his sword and engaged Huo's Hua. Within moments, Chen Jiu had defeated Huo's Hua. Sheathing his sword, Chen Jiu turned to Huo's Hua and questioned whether this was how he intended to protect Ki Wan Bao. He then directed a surge of spiritual energy toward Ki Wan Bao. In response, Huo's Hua stepped forward, shielding her, and declared that he would protect her even at the cost of his life. Su. The Lord, confronted Chen Jiu, condemning the audacity of a fox spirit who dared to harm both Huo's Hua and Ki Wan Bao. Su vowed to end Chen Jiu's life on the spot. Ki Wan Bao, alarmed, cried out for them to wait. Su Hanya finally managed to grind through the ropes binding him with a sturdy object. He then helped Sakin Qin loosen her restraints, and together they discussed their escape plan. Su Hanya made a loud noise, diverting the guard's attention. As they turned around, he swiftly scattered a mesmerizing powder, causing them to collapse on the ground. Taking advantage of the distraction, Su Hanya grabbed Sakin Qin, and they fled from their captors. Ki Wan Bao took the sword from Huashia's hand and walked towards Chen Jiu. She asked him if he had come again today for her heart and soul. He replied affirmatively. Then she questioned why he believed he could take her heart and soul from her. In response, he asked her if any of the words she spoke to him on Valentine's Day at the theater were sincere. She remained silent. So, he pressed further, asking if any of those words were genuine, to which she responded that he had never been sincere with her, so why would he want her sincerity? With that, she thrust the sword into his heart, declaring that it was her answer. Chen Jiu looked at her in disbelief and then laughed. He calmly said that he chose to believe in her nonsensical words even though he knew she had no intention behind them. Today, he acknowledged that he brought this suffering upon himself, that he deserved it. He mentioned how he always protected her, refrained from hurting her, and never deceived her. Despite being accused of harming practitioners, he asserted that he only sought to reclaim what rightfully belonged to him. Even if his initial approach was for cultivation purposes, the sincerity he showed for her should not be ignored. He spoke of his innocence in the incidents on Yushin, breaking the sword lodged in him and tossing it onto the character for happiness. Chen Jiu lifted his head and addressed Huashan, pointing out that Lord Huo also accused him of the crimes on Yushin. He then questioned who had saved Lord Huo. Huashan remained silent. Ki Wan Bao looked at Huashan's expression, then turned back to Chen Jiu, asking for clarification. She inquired if he hadn't killed anyone, to which Chen Jiu didn't respond. Instead, he turned away and left the scene of the wedding. Hubili sat at the entrance of Kishinman and witnessed Chen Jiu being wounded. Realizing that Ki Wan Bao was responsible, he declared that he would kill her today to avenge Lord Huo. Chen Jiu, however, grabbed him and urged him to return to Baiming. Ki Wan Bao, who asked why he would do such a thing. Huo's Hua claimed that ever since Chen Jiu appeared, Ki Wan Bao no longer saw him. 
Even when he went to Yudao Mountain to pick the purple spirit fruit for her, she showed no gratitude except for superficial thanks. He also mentioned that the dress was not genuinely meant for him but was intended for the fox spirit. Kiwanbeo accused him of harboring resentment and questioned why he would slander Chang Jiu. He asserted that it was because of jealousy and stated that he, being a fox, should die. Kiwanbeo, angered, demanded him to repeat what he said, and when he did, she slapped him. He retorted, mentioning that she had hit him for a fox, reminding her that she was his wife. Kiwanbeo, considering their childhood bond, spared him this time but declared that they were now unrelated. If he dared to mention wife again, she wouldn't spare him. Kiwanbeo tossed the headdress from her wedding attire and left the scene. Huo's Hyea, angered, mentioned that the sword wound on Chang Jiu was inflicted by her own hands, so she had no one to blame but herself. Kiwanbeo acknowledged that everyone's harm to Chang Jiu was minimal, and only she was the one who hurt him the most. Then she tearfully admitted that she deserved to die for believing those lies and fainted. Huo's Hyea returned home, filled with disappointment. In a fit of frustration, he took a sword and swung it, venting his anger on the clothing associated with the failed wedding. Each stroke served as a physical release for the pent-up resentment within him. Gillian and the senior disciple arrived at the now-empty wedding venue, bewildered by the transformation of what was meant to be a joyful occasion. The senior disciple remarked on the abrupt change. Gillian, with a solemn expression, instructed the senior disciple to remove all the red decorations and fabrics, signifying the cancellation or disruption of the wedding festivities. Kiwanbeo kept writing Chang Jiu's name repeatedly, tears streaming down her face as she uttered, Chang Jiu, I'm sorry. A gust of wind swept through, lifting the written papers into the air, causing them to dance around the room. Granny sat beside Chang Jiu and remarked, Never did I expect the future celestial fox of the fox clan to be tossed around like this by a mortal woman. Chang Jiu replied, The past is already dead. I won't make such foolish mistakes again. Granny observed that the woman had a cruel heart to stab him in the wound of his soul-extinguishing sword. Hubili added that Kiwanbeo had targeted Lord Huo's wound, clearly hurting him emotionally. Chang Jiu told Hubili that it was enough, he and Kiwanbeo were no longer connected, and he forbade any mention of her in his presence. To his grandmother, Chang Jiu mentioned that he had considered matters regarding the heart and soul. His grandmother advised him not to dwell on it for now suggesting that they discuss it more thoroughly when he had recovered. She asked if it would be all right to have Yuxuan take care of him, to which he agreed, deferring to his grandmother's arrangements.